podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. The sudden loss of a beloved child, the damning sentence of incurable cancer, the disloyal indiscretions of a husband she adored. How does Elizabeth Edwards deal with this triple set of slammers? She lays it out all very powerfully in her New York Times best-selling book, Resilience, which will be the topic of our conversation when we visit with her on North Carolina Book Watch next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is provided by financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. And by Quail Ridge Books and Music, Raleigh's independent full-service bookstore, bringing readers and writers together since 1984. Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. I'm D.G. Martin, and my guest is uh, Elizabeth Edwards, who is the author of uh, a new book, Resilience. It's great to see you, D.G. Well, it's great to see you, and thank you for coming. Your, your father was a naval officer, so you grew up in lots of different places, but you spent, now I guess, the better part of your life here in North Carolina, either as a student, uh, undergraduate student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a graduate student, and then a law student, and then uh, as a lawyer yourself and as a, a housewife, mom, yep. and, uh, and now author. But the Ch Chapel Hill is home now. Well, um, you, you, you do have this North Carolina viewpoint. I have to say that the, your book is very powerful in lots of different ways and in terms of how to deal with the troubles that, are your troubles, but um, Troubles like all of us face exactly. unexpected disappointments and unexpected tragedies that happen in our lives uh, that you wrestle with. The, your model, and then who became my model, is your father. And yes. you talk in your first chapter about his great example of resilience. And I wonder if you'd share that, if you'd talk a little bit about your father and about how he faced, you know, uh, maybe as tragic and a thing in his life as, as could happen. Um, my dad was uh, an incredibly vibrant, um, uh, energetic, engaging man. Uh, he uh, was 6'3", had been a, a football player at the Naval Academy, um, and then it, uh, when he broke his nose, he picked up lacrosse and was All-American. I mean, he was a great athlete and a real gregarious man. Uh, used to. I remember him when I was in junior high school, picking women up and turning them upside down. You know, their skirts would fall every place, and they would giggle. And it was uh, he was he just he was always the center of everything. And he didn't mind being a buffoon if that was necessary. He didn't mind acting like a child if he was around children. He just embraced life in every possible way, and particularly in physical ways. He was a very because he was a big man and an athlete. He was very physical. Uh, he actually was assistant lacrosse coach at Carolina when he was here. Um, but in 1990, uh, after a morning of biking and playing tennis, he just fell over after dinner and uh, had a stroke. Uh, probably um, a small stroke, but later that night he had a large stroke and was immobilized in large part for the rest of his life. Uh, he was told that the rest of his life was going to be very short, but the rest of his life turned out to be 18 more years. Uh, he despite the fact that he was told he was going to die when he was asked by the rehabilitation people what he wanted to do he said drive <laughs> he thought really dad but i understand did, right? i understand that's right but he did he did drive again you might not have wanted to be on the well, road well this was with a him. guy i mean he couldn't and, and a lot of time stroke victims uh, recover amazingly but but he, he was almost dead yeah Is, he, he 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 was told that he he was he, we were told that he was that he was brain dead that he was paralyzed, that, that he was not going, you know, that basically this was the end of any life as he had known it or as we had known him. Um, 
but he, you know, fought uh, his uh, way. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, there's some right. I mean, in the middle of all this tragedy, I mean, the, the, the family's reaction was, get us another. We don't there, want to see this doctor again. <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, uh, the, what, what happened. Get us uh, a new doctor. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I mean, it, when my father opened his eyes, and by his eyes telling me, I'm, I'm not brain dead, I understood what he said, and, and, uh, and I, I, I need you to believe in, that I'm in here. Um, and it was impossible not to. He believed so much in himself and his ability to grab onto life that, that um, we had to get rid of the doctor who didn't believe and, and get somebody who did believe uh, on his side. And then, you know, he didn't honestly, I mean, he, rehabilitation helped, but you know, he, he, never really re, he never really regained use of his right side. He continued to have aphasia, the inability to speak clearly. His, his mind would tell him what to say, but it wouldn't come out of his mouth in the right way. Um, and, and then he sort of increased to the best he could by trying. And then old age started hitting him, and he started going into decline. And uh, at the end of his life, at the end of the 18 years, he had broken his hip, and he couldn't do rehab, so he was in a wheelchair, or he was uh, in bed, and he could hardly speak. But he was still you know, making jokes with his eyes or pretending to smoke cigarettes in order to annoy, uh, and annoy us or, or um, you know, uh, winking at uh, either the, the people at the uh, assisted living center or at little girls who happened through uh, either our children or, or the children of his, uh, his roommate. But he, he just continued to embrace life every single day, even though he knew it was smaller and smaller. And it'd be really easy to be frustrated. And I think there were times when he was, but he would, you know, even when he got frustrated, he would, you know, that would recommit him to enjoying whatever it was his life was now. Even though it wasn't what he wanted, he would he recommit himself to enjoying that. It, it, the, it, uh, the words "embrace life as it is" seem to be, in large part, uh, uh, the message that you were struggling that you've been struggling for it in is. wrestling with these three tough parts of your life. It is. Uh, but how does your dad's example help you? Now, this uh, I, mean, I mean, this is so hard, but I mean, it's just quite clear that the loss of Wade, your beloved right. son now many years ago but when he was 16 is something that you'll really never successfully no. get to the point where you can really embrace life without it being a yeah. uh, how, how do you how do you do that I have to I have to accept that um, I mean for a very long time I kept thinking you know God was going to turn back time or I was gonna, it was somehow a mistake I was going to and I just couldn't really accept that I was never going to see him again and I just have, to, but I've, I've now come to the point, he's, he, he's just had his 30th birthday, I've, and he died when he was 16. Uh, I've come to the point where I accept that what he is in my life is an, a really important part. It, that part of me is just as alive today as it was uh, when he died. But that the person he was, that the, I will never embrace him again, he will not get to enjoy the things I hoped that he would enjoy, uh, and I, I, I really have come to accept it. I don't like it, but I know I can't change it. Uh, all I can do is keep him alive with his younger brothers and sisters who never met him to try to make him um, uh, the things that are, we've done in his memory, the learning labs, uh, computer learning labs in, in Raleigh and in Goldsboro, uh, short fiction contest, uh, statewide short fiction contest for young people, get those keep those things alive so that the things he cared about are still um, a part of people's lives even though he isn't. Well one of the interesting parts of your book is how you um, how you explain or bring Wade into the life of a family that has come along since yeah. since his death and which, which in many I mean it, it must be a trick to the for the children, for the new, for the, uh, for the younger the children, children, the second, for the, set, of the children. second <laughs> set of children, to, to uh, say, here's um, a, a child that we never knew, but we, our, our mother wants us to know. Right. right. Well, the, if if he had moved away, if he was living in Australia at age 30, they wouldn't see him much, but we would still t still tell stories about things that funny things that happened that involved him. Um, his picture would still be sitting out. Uh, He'd be part of conversations, and those things still happen. 
a lot of, I know there's an urge by some people because it's so painful just to erase everything. I found it much more therapeutic just to keep his memory alive, um, uh, particularly for the children who, the, my younger children who never knew him. It, it's very alive for our older daughter, Kate, who grew up with him, but, but the younger children didn't. But Emma Claire honestly thinks that he's, you know, that she knew him. At one point she said to me, you know, what makes me really sad about Wade? And I said, and I, I, thought, I thought, well, uh, you know, I know a lot of things that would make me sad about Wade. I said, what is it? And she said that Jack never knew him. And oh, I thought, well. Yeah. I thought, well, you never. This is the younger, the younger. You, the, uh, my young, her, her younger brother never knew him. And I said, uh, I was thinking to myself, but I didn't say to her, you never knew him either. But she was so, he was so much a part of the family life, the stories and the pictures, that she just assumed that she had known him as when he was, when she was younger. Um, and that, to me, is a great thing. No, I, I think probably it's, it's hard to find anything as hard for a mother to deal with in the loss of a child. And, and many mothers have to do this. Too many. And some, uh, and, and deal with it in all different kinds of ways. Some making it very private. Right. Uh, it, it still hurts every day, but making yes. it very private. Others, and I would say you would be at, the, at, 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 at one of the far ends right. of less celebrate and talk about this child forever. And in, in the range of all of these ways, people find their, their the right way well, to the, do this. Right, it, and, and I've, I've tried to be really clear about that. Whatever way you decide is the way that makes you feel better. It's the right way. Because there isn't one particular right way. Um, some people don't feel like they can uh, talk about it publicly too much. I think they do still want to hear from other people that they remember him and that, that or, or her and that um, and they remember him fondly still to you know years later. But um, uh, what you know if if you want to go to the grave every day, if you never want to go, whatever is the thing that makes you feel most at peace is the thing that's the right thing. Um, and I, you know this not this is not a recipe book. You know, the, to say, do this and you'll feel better, and do that and you'll feel better. Um, it, it is, but it is to say what? It's to say that you, that, you, you, that you do have to accept that your life has changed. And then you have to, with these changed circumstances, find your new life. Whatever, you know, find your, make the best of, just as my father did, of whatever more narrowed life. We don't have any trouble when our lives expand and become more wonderful. We have a great deal of trouble when they narrow and things that we found joyful are no longer available to us. Part of the, uh, the I guess, dilemma or the trick is that in that, that formula of let's take life as it is and make the best of it, which was your dad's, the, which right. we, he lived came by. across very clearly from your dad, and I love that first, you know, read the first chapter, you don't read anything else. <laughs> um, but then part of the trick in facing the future is in part putting some of that past and hoped for what, what we hoped our life would be like, sort of behind us. Right. And, and, but with, with the loss of weight, you can't do, you, in making your new life, you can't, you just can't do that. I, well, I, I don't, I mean, I don't want to put him uh, in a box and, and store him away someplace. Um, uh, I want to take what still remains. When you have a relationship with someone, uh, we, you know, we've known each other for at least on a casual basis for some time. You have a relationship with me. I have a relationship with you. If you were to go away, you know, uh, then uh, move someplace else, I wouldn't know what your relationship with me is, but I would still know and carry with me my relationship with you. And my relationship with Wade, my family's relationship with Wade, still is vibrant. And so we nurture that part. We can't, we can't do anything about the fact that there's no, that there's no reciprocation. But, uh, but we, can, we can nurture that. Well, you helped explain that to me in your book when you talked about the picture of Wade as a six-year-old, maybe. Right. And that you, would, you could deal with the idea that you would never have this particular Wade right. again. You just, so that sort of helps you deal with the idea that you won't have him as a 16-year-old right, or 30-year-old. That's right, and I think that a lot of parents can, that even if you haven't lost a child, you know, you, you look back 
at, at the cute things they did when they were four or five, and they do so many cute things at that age. And, you know, and you pine for it in a way. Wouldn't, you know, it's I think part of our pining for grandchildren sometimes is our pining for the, for the, the youth of our, of our children. Um, but we know we can't get it back. But that doesn't mean we don't enjoy it, that it doesn't, that it didn't enrich us even today. And, and that's, uh, you know, the hard part for, is that there's, uh, that there aren't going to be grandchildren, and there's a bittersweet part of it as well. But it's but there's still there's still the sweet part. Um, what another poignant part, and I think often overlooked part of your book, but very helpful to me was the um, wrestling with your um, religious beliefs in the context of the um, well, uh, how can a good God do these things right. to me? And you sent a signal out, almost like the psalmist, I thought of, you know, <laughs> God, where are you in all of this? And how, how, how do you wrestle with these, uh, or what questions do you wrestle with, and how do you wrestle with them, and how do you advise the rest of us to wrestle with these questions? Well, I, I've spent a great deal of time just assuming I knew who God was and God was in my life, and not really asking a lot of questions. Um, and, uh, and I've thought a lot more about it when I started to think about you know, not just Wade, but so many young people in this country and around the world. You think of, of the tragedies happening in particularly underdeveloped countries where children are born and never have a chance. You know, they just, you know, they die very young or they just never. So, so we have a good and gracious God, but who allows these things to happen a lot. And I, I thought, is, is that the God I have? Because I'm not particularly happy with that God right now. And I started to think about it, you know, it, we always say, you know, if somebody's sick, we're going to pray for them and, and God's going to intervene. And I started to think, I don't think we have an intervening God. I mean, Wade, I mean, everybody thinks that their children were really special. But Wade was just a good kid. I mean, he was a thoughtful child who was really nice to a, uh, every, He's not the kind of person God would have said, you know, oh, let him be, you know, whatever happens to him. He, he, he might be the kind of child, a, an intervening God would step in and say, let's save this one because he's been so good to people. But he didn't. And so maybe I don't have an intervening God. Maybe I have a God who doesn't promise that, but who promises something else instead. And like, 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 what, like, like salvation, what? you know, we, uh, we live in the way he hopes us to for us to live and we will have salvation. And then we will have understanding. Uh, understanding maybe of why he didn't intervene. Uh, and I think we think of things as, as created by God, but the truth is, I think a lot of the misery that happens to human beings, it wasn't maybe created by that human being, but was created by all of us. You know, we know we could solve the problem of starvation in Africa, but we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, so is that something God created by droughts or is it something we allowed to happen? You know, I kind of think he's, he gives us the chance to solve it, and if we don't, then he lets the misery happen, and he let the pain happen to Wade um, and, to, and to our family, and, uh, and he, didn't, he never promised us anything else. And it's the only way that's possible for me to accept, you know, there's a, a great thing in uh, Bill Moyer's program, uh, Genesis, that he had uh, on um, public uh, stations around the country. Uh, it was it was really wonderful, and it was on UNC TV, um, uh, is where I where I saw it. And uh, someone said on the show, you know, well, God's this and this, and he said it wasn't. He said we don't have the God we want. We have the God we have. The God I want is an intervening God. The God I have is generous, but he's not intervening. I mean, that's I came to that point. Everybody has to come to their own acceptance of of what they think God is, but. But maybe my message, if there's a message in this, is to not do what I did and think, at least think about what kind of God you have, <laughs> you know, beforehand to, to think about. Uh, I think we just accept some collection of, of uh, good, generous, omnipotent things and we don't analyze really what it is he's promising and what it is he's asking of us. Well, it is. <clears throat> well, um, you have made so many friends um, and inspired many people because of uh, the association they have with you because you're a cancer victim. Yes. And what are the, I mean, I mean I, this is a terrible question, but what are the ups and downs yes. of, uh, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's terrible. But on the other hand, with all these things, there's some good things too. Or, the, what, you know, I, I, 
you always see pictures of uh, you know of the of, of people in, in uh, with scarves on and pink T-shirts yeah. at these big events, and they're hugging each other, and you're thinking, you know, that's all fine, but you know, does that really exist? There's really this camaraderie. Well, actually, there really is. I mean, you really feel a deep connection with people who have been through the kind of hardships you've been through, and cancer. Um, which even if you know if you've detected early, which is great, and and it's behind you, it's still always a part of your life because you know it can you know you're more likely for it to come back than if you've never had it, and you feel part of this community. And uh, for me, it did come back, and I and uh, I've made connections with an enormous number of people across the country uh, who have uh, done what I've done. I I don't think in any way that I'm special, you know that, but who have grabbed onto their lives. Um, maybe with more ferocity. This might be a good. Mm. This mm. might be one mm -hmm. of the good points than they had before. And said, "I'm going to. I'm going to make every day count." Because uh, another thing I hadn't thought about was that that we're all going to die, and that that each day matters. Yeah. Well, it's like uh, term limits in yes. the sense that um, if you know that you're only going to be in office for right. a limited time, you focus on what you can get done in right. those times. And so I, I, I don't pretend that that's a consolation prize that's uh, you know worth celebrating right. but it does in some way season and enrich it, no, it, no it, it, it really does I mean I, I don't think there's uh, for me it was a little less um, important because having having lost Wade I already appreciated that our days are limited and we and it really matters what we do with them it's one of the reasons why um, our, my family threw itself into public service, I think, is that we thought, you know, all right, you only have this amount of time. It wasn't so much this, but it wasn't so much that his death created that, but his death created a new way of thinking about how much time you have left and what it is you want to do with it. And, um, uh, and so I'd already come a long way in, in that. Well, uh, but, I, but, but whatever it is, whatever it provokes us to understand that whether or not you know the day certain or not, there's a day certain and you only have this number of days and, and boy, they really matter. And it's not just that they matter in getting something big done, but they matter in appreciating the very little things that, that happen. When, mm. when Emma Claire was a baby, she had colic and she cried all the time. I mean, <laughs> she would cry for four hours. And I would rock her and sing to her for four hours because I thought if this was Wade, were Wade in my arms instead, would I mind his crying? Mm, mm. Not a bit. Mm. So I got to appreciate a crying baby, <laughs> which, which I never, <laughs> never, I never could have done before. That's you know, it was, it, was a, it was a brand new experience, but you got to appreciate even the things that you thought you could never appreciate. Mm. Well, we're almost out of time. One of the things you talk about, of course, is the um, disruption of your family. Yes. Um, and I, 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 I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time with that because it seemed that in your other interviews, this seemed to be the focus of uh, attention. And I wondered what your reaction was that you'd spend all this time writing this book about all kinds of things. And the, and well, that's not fair, but but the, yeah. the, the but that the uh, focus was on. Uh, uh, part of your life that you're going through really right now and how you dealt with that. You seem to always be cheerful as you're being interviewed, but I said, when, you, when are they going to ask when, when, gonna, yeah. or when am I going to reach part, or, across and slug this person? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is it's a very small part of the book. I thought it would have been dishonest not to include it, and so I felt it was important to, to, to not to be dishonest in that respect, and so I did include it. it was, I, I wrangled with it a very long time, um, but decided to do it really from the same perspective I did all the other things that I talked about in the book, which is how it was I dealt with it. Not, you know, nothing about the sort of details, but how it was I dealt with it and how it was I came to accept that I had this new reality. And, uh, and so that's what I talk about in there, is that the, the ways in which we're assaulted, uh, our, the, our life dreams are assaulted, our life plans are assaulted, come in so many different forms. You know, with the economic crisis, you're seeing people lose homes that they, uh, that they had, had dreamed and hoped for for a very long time. And I, I met somebody in the campaign trail who told me a story that I'll, I'll never forget, and I so hope that their, that their house is safe uh, through all of this crisis. But she said she, she, she told her son, you know, Dad and I bought a house. I, I, we're moving out of this place we've been renting and we're moving into our own house. She said, a house with a sidewalk. And it just took my breath away. 
that people have these dreams and they work so hard for them and they mean so much to them and they can be taken away. And, and, and I've had things taken, you know, taken away in my life that, are, that were very important to me. But, but the variations in the way it can happen to people are, are really uh, um, almost as many as, as many as there are people. Well, the way that you um, explain all of these challenges in your life and disappointments and the message coming from your father's bedside really yes. about, uh, I think you said if he can do it, I can. Yes. Um, but living our lives as they are, having dealing with our God as he or she is, yes. uh, is a message that I think um, helps all of us as we try to face life with resilience. So we thank you for both your book and for taking time to share with us Thanks. today. Thanks. It's, it's a treat to be with you, DJ. Great to be with you. Elizabeth Thanks. Edwards, who has been our guest on North Carolina Book Watch, she's the author of Resilience. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Elizabeth Edwards' book or about our other guests and upcoming programs, check our website. And I'll be right back here next week and we'll get to visit with another one of North Carolina's great writers. See you then. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is provided by financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. And by Quail Ridge Books and Music, Raleigh's independent full-service bookstore, bringing readers and writers together since 1984. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.